Hello, and thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. Hello, and thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. Hello, and thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. Hello, and thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. Hello, and thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation.
Hello, and thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. Hello, and thank you for joining this live webinar presented by the Cisco Learning Network. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the Cisco Learning Network, and information on how to access the recording will be emailed to you following the live session. Please allow up to five business days for the full recording to be made available. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us and Happy New Year. I hope that 2024 is off to a great start for all of you. My name is Rigo Villa. I'm one of the community managers on the Cisco Learning Network, and I'll be your host today. In this session, we will be diving into ICE and dual integration for MFA with our speaker and presenter, Thomas Howard. But before we get started, I wanted to share a couple of quick housekeeping notes. First, I want to let our attendees know that if we run into any technical issues during the webinar, we'll do our very best to resolve it as soon as possible. So we just want to thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. Next, if you have any questions during the session, we ask that you please post them in the question and answer panel as displayed on the screen here in front of you. This would help our, our panelists manage and keep track of all of your questions and would also allow them to provide you with a much more timely response. Also, if you experience any audio streaming issues during the live presentation, I do recommend using the call and telephone number that I'm going to be posting in the chat window here in just a moment. And at the end of this webinar, you are going to get a pop up survey with a couple of questions about today's presentation. And we would really appreciate it if you can just take a moment to fill it out and share with us any thoughts or feedback that you may have about today's session. I also want to let our attendees know that this session will be recorded and will be available for on demand viewing within approximately five business days after today. And I'll be sure to share some more information about that in the chat window a little bit later on. And last but not least, I want to let everyone know about our upcoming ICE webinar. So next month, we are going to be covering Secure Radius and TACX Plus to ICE with IPsec native tunnels, and that'll be on Thursday, February 22nd. And I've been, I'm going to be sharing some information on how you can register for this upcoming session a little bit later on as well. And without any further delay, I am now going to hand it over to our speaker to get us started. So Thomas, if you're ready, please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Rigo. Hi, everyone. I'm Thomas Howard. I'm one of the ICE technical marketing engineers here at Cisco. And uh, today we wanted to be talking about a brand new feature that just came out in ICE 3.3 with patch one. Uh, and these are the things you want to cover. First, we'll talk about patch releases, and then uh, we'll get into the enhanced ICE and Duo integration for MFA. And we'll show you how that works with VPN as well as device administration, and then give you 
the resources and guides so you can actually go implement it yourself if you want to. So the first thing I wanted to talk about with you all today is patches. Uh, you'll notice that we release patches every few months per release. Uh, the, the main thing is for those of you that are still on the ICE 2.x release, your final patch for ICE 2.x has already gone out. Uh, so there are no more updates, no more vulnerability fixes, no nothing in ICE 2.x. Uh, so that is it. So if you haven't uh, gone to patch 10, you want to get it as the last one. Uh, and then start upgrading to ICE 3.0 because 2.7 is going to be um, end of life later this year. So keep that in mind. Uh, we encourage you to go ahead and you know always be upgrading and patching. And the one patch that we're talking about today specifically is ICE 3.3 patch one, because this is the patch that this feature is delivered in. So if you just have ICE 3.3, you won't have this feature. You'll need to go ahead and upgrade to patch one to get it. And this is interesting. If you didn't know that we actually ship a lot of new features in our patches. Uh, the reason for this is because it allows us to give you incremental feature capabilities in these large ice releases that only come you know, every eight or nine months. We're able to deliver these things much faster to you so you don't have to do a major upgrade. You can just do a patch and get some of these newer features. And so you can see here, uh, in ICE 3.2, we have four patches out currently, and every single one of those patch releases has several new features in it. And so if you didn't know that that's something we've been doing in the ICE 3.x releases, uh, go ahead and take a look at those patches and kind of see what are all the new things that we're including in there that we don't always get in the the, the large releases that we do. So uh, what we want to talk about today is obviously zero trust. Uh, and you use ICE to establish zero trust along with Duo to make sure that you can uh, clearly authenticate that user and the device that you have and be able to enforce access using zero trust at the network access edge through segmentation. And then we can integrate with other security products in order to continuously verify your trust uh, based on your network behavior and, and other things that we get from other security partner products. And if there is any change that's bad, we of course want to be able to respond to that and do a change of authorization and and uh, deal with it appropriately or quarantine the user or device. So in ICE, we do that. Um, as you know, ICE is your, your favorite uh, AAA radius and TACAC server. It can be deployed as appliances in a highly distributed way all over the world in VMs, appliances, and in uh, cloud providers. We control access to the network through our network devices doing access control uh, for all those endpoints as they're coming to the network. And then we authenticate them on the back end against different identity services. And we can even share that information about the authenticated users and devices out to different partner security services like Cisco Secure Products and, and many others that we integrate with. So this is kind of the whole uh, breadth of things that ICE does to do access control and zero trust uh, with these devices in the workplace. This allows us to see all the devices coming in, secure them, make sure our network is, is, is secured, and then of course share that information out with those, with those other security services. And, you know, when we, when we do want to authenticate our different users and devices coming in, we have a lot of different options. And whenever we authenticate, we usually use some kind of different factor uh, for authentication, which is typically something you know, something you possess, or something that's of your, you know, your biological being or constitution. Uh, so these are all the different factors, and you can have different combinations of these factors to go from, you know, basically no nothing to multiple factors. And this usually comes with some level of convenience involved, right? And typically when we think about doing network access authentication, we think about using the IEEE 802.1x protocol with a password, a username and a password, right? But there are lots of other ways you can do it. So back in the old days, we had open networks. We didn't have any authentication at all. Then Radius came along to help us do that. Um, it's uh, not uncommon to do MAC authentication bypass or MAB on the wired network and even sometimes even the wireless. But a lot of times you use um, WPA or um, 
multiple pre-shared keys uh, to be able to do this. I call them zero-ish because, um, you know, Mab, that can be spoofed. And in the case of pre-shared keys, it's it's pre-shared and you can have multiples and multiple people can share the same one. So it's not really a, a strong identity for that. So that's why I say zero-ish. Uh, and then you get into single factors, which you have IPSK. And if you don't have a password, maybe you have a certificate. And that's, those are all gr great options. Then when you can also get into this multiple factor area. Uh, so you can combine a certificate from a machine with a, mach a certificate from a user. And then you can also do uh, MFA with something like Duo or any other MFA provider where you can do um, passcodes. You can do biometrics, uh, you have lots of different options, combining with location, all these different factors um, that you want to be able to ensure the identity of your user, right? Then there's one more, something coming out, a security key is quite popular. Um, I love using my security key, um, but if you misplace your security key, um, it can be a real challenge uh, and make it a really, really bad, inconvenient user experience. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, and you will notice I called out some different things above MFA, um, hibernation, roaming, and idle or session timeouts. So the reason this is important is because when we're talking about a user experience, uh, yes, MFA is great for security. However, if you re if you have a reauthentication triggered because a mobile device tries to save power and hibernate and then come back up and then go down and come back up and go down right that could potentially trigger a lot of multi-factor reauthentications and that could be really annoying to a user right or if you're walking around a campus or business park and you're getting constantly you're roaming around different ap's you're getting reauthenticated right uh, in addition to the normal idle or session timeouts that you may be getting from the network. Uh, this can be, uh, you know, authentication fatigue on the user. So just because it's there doesn't mean you should always use it or just be aware of the context in which you use it, right? Uh, that's one of the things you want to, to, to be aware of. Um, one of the places that you will definitely want to use it is with VPN. Uh, there's lots of things in the in headlines in the news all the time. This is one that I picked up a few months ago. And it shows that a lot of customers uh, are deploying VPNs with these very typical have very strong passwords. Uh, and the first one was logging in with the account test and password test. So if you are going to configure something this basic, this easy to crack, um, definitely you want to enforce MFA or multi-factor authentication. That just you know if you if you're going to do it, at least have that that option there. You should definitely do better passwords. Uh, but if you do, MFA is the answer. That's what everyone recommends. And so to do that with ICE and Duo, uh, basically you've got your different users that are going to come in. And when ICE gets that um, request, we can ask, we can challenge the user for their password, which is great. And then we have the ability to forward the uh, authentication request over to the Duo Auth proxy um, the way this works is today you would have to set up like a virtual machine uh, in your on-premise environment sitting next to or near ICE so that ICE can forward this request off to Duo. And then it would be able to authenticate the user via Active Directory or some other um, uh, authentication identity store um, in the cloud or whatever, whatever your service provider is. Uh, and then if that passes, they can go ahead and talk to the dual cloud service to make sure th that the user has their multi-factor device and that it's truly them. And once it's verified, we can let them in. So that's basically how it has worked for the past several years with ICE and Duo working together uh, or any uh, multi-factor uh, identity service. So. What we've done in ICE 3.3 patch one is we've actually taken that Duo service and packaged it in a little container in ICE so that now we can talk directly to the Duo cloud service using their native APIs. And we don't need to rely on that other VM um, authentication proxy. ICE can go ahead and talk directly to Active Directory, Directory as it normally does, synchronize those users and groups up to the dual cloud service 
And then when those users come in and we want to trigger that second factor, ICE can make that authentication API call directly into the Duo service and it will do the rest for us. And once we get the response back that they were truly authenticated um, with their multiple factor options, then ICE can let them in and authorize them. The one thing I'll mention today with this feature is it's only uh, uh, working with Active Directory on-premise, not with Microsoft's Entra ID or formerly known as Azure Active Directory. Uh, it's only with on-site Active Directory. So this is one of the one of the things. So you need to make sure that just because you have MFA, that's a fantastic thing. Uh, you definitely want it. For some scenarios, IoT devices, they don't have fingers, they don't have phones, so they can't perform an MFA. So you still need to re rely on other methods right, to do that. And that's uh, basically you know, what Gartner has said in some of these different articles is um, MFA is wonderful, but it doesn't solve all your security problems. You still need to go secure the rest of your network. <laughs> you can't just do MFA and call it done, right? Uh, hackers just know that, oh, okay, this is a smart organization. They've got MFA enabled. So now let's go hack into I IoT devices or something instead, right? So you want to make sure you, you secure those devices. And I say this because uh, you hear a lot about multi-factor multi authentication, all these different services offering it, uh, but it isn't the silver bullet. You need to use an MFA product along with ICE on-premise to handle both the on-premise and cloud-based scenarios. So Duo and ICE are extremely complementary in this way. And so if you're looking at deploying, if you think you can just do MFA with something like Duo, um, no, it's not going to work. You're still going to have gaps. Um, so you want to make sure you have ICE as well. The same thing if you have ICE, uh, hopefully all the things I'm telling you today, you realize you really want MFA. You're going to go do that as well. So uh, very complimentary is the point. And if you want to get started with Duo, I'm assuming you're at an ICE webinar because you already have ICE. Uh, or you're seriously thinking about getting it. And while you're at it, you should probably get some Duo as well to do this MF, this cool MFA stuff I'm talking about. And you can get an account very quickly and easily at signup.duo.com. You'll get 30 days of the Advantage license to play with. And I tell you this because uh, when you create this integration that we're about to show you, uh, you must be an owner or an administrator of that Duo account because in order to configure the Duo admin API to talk with ICE, you will need to be an owner in the owner or administrator role for that account. So you either need to work with your, your uh, Duo admin uh, for your organization if, if you don't have this and you want to try it, or if you want to do your own little proof of concept, then you're going to want to get this account, try it out, and then work with your Duo administrator to, to see how it works uh, with, with your org officially. Said, uh, once you do that, once you get your account, you can go ahead and you can log in to the Duo dashboard at admin.duosecurity.com. And then once you do that, you actually get redirected um, into a specific uh, Duo site. It looks something like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and configure this service really quickly for ICE. So you can see here when I log in, you can see I have that owner privilege. So I'm able to do the authentication API or the admin API, I should say. Um, we want to protect an application, and you can see there's a lot of different applications that Duo can secure. We're going to, you can just search for the admin API, not the Duo admin panel, but the admin API. And then we also want the auth API. These are the two different APIs that we need, and you can just click the protect button. Um, I've already gone through and done that um, just to save a little bit of time, but really quickly, what it does is it allocates a couple of um, keys that we're going to be able to use. You just give it a name like ICE Admin API. Make sure that you check the read and write options. Don't uncheck them like I just did. Um, make sure you keep them checked and save those changes. So you need to read and write with the Admin API. That basically um, allows you to sync your Active Directory um, users. And then we have the Auth API, which allows you to perform the actual authentication challenge request with MFA. So currently we have no users, right? And what we want to be able to do is go ahead and go into ICE and integrate those um, I keys and S keys that you just saw us generate for those two APIs inside of ICE. So the way that works is we flip over to ICE and now we're going to go ahead and configure those things. 
And where that's located in ICE 33 patch one is under external identity sources. Um, you can see we already have an active directory integrated into this deployment. And just real quick, um, take a look, you can see our AD is looking good. We have some groups and we can go ahead and we can see we have these different groups here already configured. We've we've pulled them down so they're available for our different policies in ICE. So this is probably your existing ICE deployment, right? Um, if oh, you have all this stuff. But now all you need to do to enable the MFA integration is go into the settings. And you notice we already have one for the REST ID store for Azure Active Directory integration. And now we have one for multi-factor authentication. So simply turn that on, click Save, and that will activate the container to do those APIs. You'll notice it's a, um, a beta feature. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, and what you can do now is go back to this panel and you'll see you have two new entries, one for MFA, one for identity sync. For MFA, you went out, we now want to go configure those API integrations with ICE that we did in, inside of Duo. So let's give it a name. We'll keep it simple and say Duo MFA. Then now we get to do a bunch of copying and pasting. We go back and forth, uh, copying these different keys and settings over. So we're going to start with the admin API. And basically, we just do the token dance, I like to call it, uh, where we copy these tokens over. Uh, first the host name, then the I key, then the S key, right? And then for the authentication API, do the same thing, I key and S key and test it. All right, so looking good. So now that we have that, um, we know we're, we have a successful connection, no problem there with a the firewall or anything. Uh, let's go ahead and just update our, our identity sync name and say, yeah, this is the Active Directory. You might have multiple Active Directories. This is the one we're going to integrate with. And these are the groups that we want. And I'll just turn this one off just to show you can choose different ones that you want to sync. And summary, here's everything we just configured. Looks good. Done. OK. So let's take a look at our settings now. Good. We've got, we know we're configured. We can see there's our AD groups. Fantastic. And let's look at our identity sync. You can see we now have a dcloud AD that we configured there. And again, our AD groups that should be syncing. And we should be able to take a look, see a summary. If you've got multiple different um, Active Directories that you're syncing to, you can go in, you can resync them. Uh, whenever you do an update, if you add users, change things, you might want to go in and resync them manually. And if you've got a lot of users, it'll say that it's pending there in the sync status. But if you go back into Duo now, you take a look at your users, there's our users. So you can see we have all these users that just got synchronized. I basically pushed them from Active Directory into Duo so it knows these users. And we can associate these users with mobile phones or other device actor authentication. So it's pretty much that easy. Um, so what we want to do is perform an authentication now. So what we do is I want to show you our network devices real quick. Um, so we have an ASA and a, and a router that we're going to be using uh, for our, our test today. And you'll also notice that we've configured some uh, network device groups to match on these. So VPN devices and iOS devices. And this is always really helpful when we configure our, our network access policies, right? So what we're going to do is first we're doing VPN. So we've got this remote access VPN policy uh, that we're just going to duplicate. Um, since we're configuring this for the first time, I want to just keep the old one intact. We'll, we'll do this other one. We'll call it RAVPN with MFA. And we'll put it above. That way it gets hit first uh, before going on to the next one. And so we're going to modify this one so that we are able to do the Duo MFA. And nothing's changed with the authentication policy, but you'll notice there's this new MFA policy entry inside of the policy set now. And we can go ahead and give that a Duo MFA name. And what we want to do, since this is, um, yeah, we got to do 
do MFA. And just so you know, if the MFA fails, of course, we're going to reject the user. That would be bad to let them in if they got rejected from MFA. We want to associate uh, a condition so that all of the VPN devices, if you're a VPN device, we want to perform multi-factor authentication on these authentication requests coming in, right? Um, that way, it's really easy just to do it for all the VPN devices. Otherwise, we've got all these existing authorization rules. We haven't touched anything else. So if you've got your existing policy, that's how easy it is to add MFA to your existing policy set. So now, uh, you can see I got my phone. And if I'm going to connect to my VPN, as an employee, I got my normal password that I put in. And hopefully, if all goes well, boom, there it is. So are you logging in with the ISO auth API? Yes, I am. And there we go, right? So that fast, we were able to do our multi-factor authentication for VPN. And now if you go and you look down, you can see we've got our employee that authenticated. We've got the authentication entry. And it succeeded. And we can see all the other normal details for our authentication request. And of course, we have all the different steps. And notice that latency. I love this new latency feature in, in ICE 3.3. This is really cool. It actually breaks it down. And you can see, you know, the users are really, really slow. Um, and actually, seven seconds is actually pretty fast for an MFA response because I have my phone right there. Usually, I have to run downstairs. Um, but you can see all the other normal things um, for doing this. Uh, so just remember uh, that your users you know, if they've got to run around the house to find the phone, you're going to see some some large latencies here um, when they go to to find their phone to perform that MFA. So just be aware of that that detail uh, when you're looking through your logs. You see these large latencies. Um, that's what typically happens. And also, you want to set your your radius timeouts appropriately in your devices to allow for that if you are going to be doing uh, multi-factor authentication with something like Duo. All right. So there you go. That's how fast and easy it was to add ICE to an existing VPN deployment for multi-factor authentication with Duo. So what you just saw was the capability in the ICE 3.3 patch one release. And we're considering this a beta. You saw probably the, the little, uh, the beta keyword there when we enabled the feature. And uh, what this means is uh, it's we know it's the first release of this. We think it's pretty cool. Hopefully you saw it worked really, really well for VPN really fast. Um, but we know there's more to come. We know that there's other things that we want to do. So if you try this out, we encourage you to provide feedback. Uh, you'll notice that there was actually a, a link for beta feedback. When you turned on MFA, it goes to our ICE wish list page. So if you ever want to submit a feature request to our ICE product management team, you can click on that or go to this URL. They all go to the same place and submit it. Uh, but we already know that there's things that we want to do, which is um, here in this general availability list. So we're expecting in the next patch for ICE 3.3, 3.3 patch 2, we're going to have these additional capabilities in that patch release to build on what we what I just showed you. Uh, probably the the one of the biggest ones I know is auto syncing intervals. So when I showed you that we had to go in and manually click the sync button to synchronize our list of Active Directory users and groups, that's a manual sync process, uh, and that's not very convenient. You don't want to have to go in there every day or even every hour and click sync to make sure all your latest users that have been added to your your organization's Active Directory are synchronized into Duo. That's really, really annoying. Uh, so we know that's going to get um, got to get fixed and have an auto sync interval. Uh, there's other things as well, uh, but if you play with it and you have some suggestions, please give us feedback on that. And then finally, we know that um, it's not enough to have just Active Directory, right? Um, Entra ID, Azure ID, uh, those are uh, that's a really popular option. And being able to do MFA in other ways um, are also uh, desired for some scenario. So that's coming in a future release. Don't know exactly if that's going to be in a patch or in 3.4. We don't know that those details yet, but just know that we're thinking about it and provide your feedback so that we can incorporate your ideas. All right. So we just saw VPN. 
Um, but that's not the only thing making the headlines, right? Um, we have hackers coming into our networks um, in a variety of different ways. And I saw this article by Brian Krebs, who's, who does some awesome uh, tech security journalism. And what I, what I saw that really caught my attention here was the headline. I mean, I've, I've traveled the world and uh, I've been a tourist. And as I travel around looking at things, I was like, wow, I could have compromised my security just by walking around looking at a place. And that's the analogy that he makes here when he talks about when people hack into networks, um, he was referring to an article uh, done by Hazel Burton um, on the Cisco Secure blogs. When somebody goes into a network, the first thing they do, right? And you've probably done this as well. You log into a device and you start doing show config, show interface, show route, show ARP, right? All these things like, where can I go? What am I connected to? What is connected? What's not connected? Um, that's exactly what hackers do, right? They want to, once they get the first foothold, they want to find out where can I go from here? What's next? Uh, and so that looking around with these basic commands um, is a giveaway, ultimately. And the other thing that caught my attention is, you know, we probably never thought that doing basic show commands uh, was a security issue potentially, right? But it is, is it's it's kind of giving away um, where the hacker can go next and in, into the into our network. And so even something as simple as show commands, you want to secure with MFA and device administration. And that's exactly one of the major features of ICE, right? Is device administration with TACAX Plus. So if you're a network admin, you can create policies in order to determine what devices you are able to control and which ones you aren't able to control. And so maybe on your security devices, that's managed by a separate security team. So you're not able to go in and change uh, their security devices. And if you are uh, a help desk admin, you're able to go in with limited capabilities uh, to, to do some of those show commands, but you're not able to change the configuration and you're also not able to go do anything on the security devices that's handled by somebody else entirely. So, you know, this is the kind of the, the basic concepts of device administration with TACAX. And TACAX is something that's been around uh, for over 30 years now, if you can believe it. It is an old protocol. Um, in fact, it predates HTTP by, by three years. And so it, it might be older than some of you on this call today. Um, but I, I want to point out that they did go out um, a few years later and they kind of formally, um, they, they documented the TACAX Plus protocol uh, in 1997. And then the same guys came back and really formalized it in 2020. So it's a protocol that's been out there. It's been around for a long time and it really works. And a lot of network devices work with TACAX. Um, one thing though, is that because it was built 30 years ago, security, or should I say really specifically encryption wasn't a thing back then. They were just happy to do, uh, to get it working and, and secure network devices. Uh, so your TACAX protocol and your radius protocols on the back end um, aren't terribly secure in and of themselves. They still give away a lot of information potentially and so you want to um, encrypt those, especially since people want to be able to do this from uh, branch offices and you don't know it's necessarily between your branch office and your your um, headquarters or wherever your your ice nodes are located. And some people now even want to send their traffic directly over the Internet. And uh, that will be bad uh, to do that over the open Internet that anybody could could capture some of that traffic. So we're going to show you next month how to secure that traffic. That's um, something we, we think is a really cool feature that's also in ICE 3.3. Uh, and if you want to get started on it today, um, know you got to have ICE 3.3. And one of our TAC engineers, Eugene Kornichuk, has done an awesome document on it. So uh, if you want to get right to it, uh, he has the document. I've created a, a nice shortcut URL for you all to go take a look at that today. So you can go uh, use that right now. Otherwise, we'll talk about it next month in the webinar. But otherwise, I want to remind you again, Yes, if your network device supports TACAX or RADIUS, it can talk to ICE, right? These are old protocols, and it's not a matter of ICE supporting it. It's a matter of the network device having the capabilities to do this stuff. Uh, so, again, any device, it doesn't matter what it is, if it supports TACAX or RADIUS, ICE can talk to it. So, all the device administration that can be done uh, with any of these devices, 
And the one notable exception is, of course, Meraki, uh, because everything is done in the cloud <laughs> using their cloud dashboard. Uh, and you can control the uh, administrator access levels in the dashboard itself. So uh, that's one thing you might want to realize there. But otherwise, if we want to configure device administration in ICE, here's how it works. So we left off with our employee doing VPN authentication. And now what we want to do is go ahead and configure device administration. And first, I want to give you a quick kind of overview of what device admin looks like inside of ICE if you haven't seen it before. So we can choose what protocols we're going to use. Uh, and typically, we just use the default device admin protocols. Again, these are not super secure protocols. Again, that's why you probably want to uh, put them into a, a native IPsec tunnel to secure them. Uh, but you can create these different command sets that your different users are allowed to access. And when you do that, it looks something like this. You can say, oh, I want to permit show commands or I want to deny other commands depending upon the user's role. And uh, pretty straightforward and simple, you can get really complicated. And you even have the option to say, just if I don't list it, just let everything go, right? Uh, so these are the, the basic options. And you can control these different profiles for what uh, iOS privilege level they're going to get when they do log in. So in this case, we're just going to assign the user to a default uh, privilege level 15 when they have access. And if we look at our existing policy sets, so just like our VPN, we have an existing iOS devices policy for our uh, device administrators. So what we're going to do is duplicate that policy and we're going to make it an MFA policy now just to test it uh, and do a quick name change after we duplicate it. And now let's go edit that new MFA policy. And you'll notice nothing has changed with the authentication policy. We're not going to touch it. Looks like we're using our Active Directory users. And we're going to add that MFA policy just like we did before with VPN. Dual MFA, really simple name. Yep, use dual MFA. And of course, if they fail, reject them. Otherwise, this time what we're going to do is instead of VPN devices, anything that comes through here is probably going to be an iOS device. That's what we said. And so for all of those iOS devices, we want to perform a multi-factor authentication whenever somebody tries to log in. Here's our existing policies. Don't have to touch any of those. Just add the MFA. And now we can go ahead and try it out. So we get on our terminal and we go ahead and SSH into our Cisco CSR and enter our admin password for secure our security admin password. And oh, looks like we got a MFA notification for that ISOF API again. And now we can go back and you can see we've logged in. We're now sitting on the command line. And we can go ahead and issue these commands, no problem. How about some other commands? How about configuration? Okay, that one's fine. How about an interface command? Uh-uh, no interface commands allowed according to our, our policy, right? So that's device administration in a nutshell, right? Allowing our users to do certain commands and not others. And now we've added multi-factor authentication quickly and easily. And just to show you what that audit trail looks like, uh, you can see if you look here in the live logs, um, it shows you for each one of those commands authorizations, it uh, passed or failed. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't tell you the exact command in the live log. For that, you actually need to go into a report. Um, you can see the command set, but you can't see the specific command that it matched in the command set. For that, you need to go into the reports and you need to go take a look at the device administration audit report. There you go, TACX authorizations. Now you can see those same commands that came in. Some worked, some didn't. And which was the violation? Who tried to issue a command that they weren't allowed to do? Sometimes you really got to scroll over to see it. We got a lot of different fields here. All right, so, okay, so those worked and then, aha, they tried to do an interface command 
and that failed, right? So that is how you're able to go in and verify your users with MFA for TACAX device administration, and then actually uh, audit what worked and what didn't and why. So if you see some lots of failures coming in, um, you know to go take a look and ask that user, why are you trying to do all these commands? You know you're not allowed to do it. All right, so if you want to uh, try this out, we already have a guide. Uh, Eugene Cornerchuk's been really busy. He did another guide for us um, on the native integration with ICE and Duo. So it's out there available for you today. Go take a look at our ICE guides page. Um, use the tag Duo, and you'll see all of our available docs for Duo. Um, we also have our device administration prescriptive deployment guide. If you want to configure device admin for the first time, we've got a doc for you on how to do that. And uh, if you are a partner um, and you want to do a similar demo to what you just saw, um, we're currently upgrading our ICE, currently it's ICE 3.1 or 3.2 um, enterprise and security demo. We're, integrate, we're upgrading it from 3.1, 3.2 to 3.3 to have patch one like this so that you can do this, these exact same demos that I just showed you. Hopefully that's gonna be coming in, in February. Uh, we'll see if that actually happens, but uh, the plan is to definitely upgrade that so that you can play with it as well. Again, this is only for partners um, or, or Cisco employees that, that have Cisco D cloud access, but uh, we do get a lot of partners on these webinars and I wanted to make sure that they knew that this, this capability was out there for them. Uh, the other thing is we have all kinds of guides out there for you. If you didn't know, we've got this, this great shortcut URL and, and just use a little hashtag with whatever it is you're looking for, whatever protocol or integration or whatever, um, and it should work for you. It's pretty cool. Uh, it should jump you right to all the different things and try to update that thing all the time with uh, all the new docs and things I'm finding. Uh, so go ahead and take a look at that and see if you uh, have, if we have what you need really. Uh, and just to give you an idea, this is a list of all those tags available. Uh, and I keep adding them all the time. So there's probably even more by now, but that's what I was able to come up with uh, for this. Last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, we did mention earlier that ICE 2.x is going end of, end of support basically at the end of this year in September. So you need to upgrade to ICE 3.x, uh, hopefully really soon. And so in order to help you with that, we wanted to, sweeten the offer with a couple of options for getting some free licensing terms one for essentials for a year uh year free and one if you upgrade to advantage or premier licensing tiers you get a one and a half years free when you buy three years so uh, if this is something that interests you because you know you need to upgrade from 2.x to 3.x this year go ahead and go to cs.co forward slash ice dash licensing and you have all the details there uh, on how to do that. So with that, um, I'll remind you all, uh, we do look at your feedback. Uh, we love hearing what you thought of our webinars. So if you could, uh, when you get the link after you finish the session today, go ahead and tell us what you loved or what you wish we would have done more or better, uh, or what we can do in the future. And we'd love to hear it. And we've got all of our usual ICE resources that we love to share with you all here. And if anyone has questions, uh, we would love to try and take them now, Rigo. Rigo, I'm not hearing you. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> Double muted there. <laughs> uh, in, in reviewing the uh, Q&A panel, I do see that uh, all the questions have been addressed by our panelists. Um, but actually, sorry, I, I spoke a little too soon. I, we just had a question come in just now. Okay. Uh, so we can go ahead and uh, take care of this one. Uh, the question is, can I configure Microsoft Azure AD MFA in ICE TACAX? Uh, not today like you can with Duo, no. You would need to use that similar um, radius authentication proxy method um, like you saw um, either to another um, MFA provider. Um, I'm pretty sure what I've seen happening with people talking to Azure Active Directory is you actually need to use an NPS uh, node, uh, Microsoft 
uh, I forget what NPS stands for, Network Protection Service or something. Uh, you need to do a radius auth proxy to that radius server, and then it can talk to Azure Active Directory. Uh, so you can do it, but you don't have the simplicity like you do with Duo to do these really simple API-based configurations. You need to do that that radius authentication proxy option, and that would work with with any. Uh, MFA provider is, is that radius auth proxy option. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we do see one other question that uh, came in just now. Does Duo have an on site option for air gap networks or is it cloud only? Yeah. So today, Duo has that uh, auth proxy option that you put on premise, but it still needs to have connectivity to the Duo cloud service to perform the MFA push or challenge, right? So I'm not aware of any air gapped options, but I'm not the Duo person. So the Duo may have that or it may be in the roadmap, but I'm not aware of that option. So you might want to dig a little deeper and ask a, someone who knows more about Duo. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, so with that, I think we could go ahead and, and wrap up our presentation for today. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, thanks again, Thomas, for, for speaking about this topic with our audience. I hope that everyone found uh, great value with the information and resources that were shared here today. I would also like to extend a very big thank you to each and every one of our panelists for lending a hand with the questions throughout the webinar. We really appreciate it. And for our attendees, if you do have any additional questions or would like to continue the conversation about today's topic, we do encourage you to participate in our online post webinar discussion. You are going to be redirected upon exit, uh, but just in case uh, I did post the link into the chat window where that discussion will be taking place. So we do look forward to your participation. And a quick reminder to our audience that you will receive a short pop up survey as as Thomas mentioned uh, as soon as you exit this webinar. So we would be really grateful if we can just take a few minutes to complete it and let us know how you like today's presentation. We always look forward to receiving your valuable feedback. And again, for those of you who may be interested in revisiting this webinar, we will have the recording available for on demand viewing within approximately five business days after today. And the links have been posted into the chat window there for your reference uh, as well. And uh, one last quick reminder about our upcoming webinar. So next month we are going to be covering secure radius and TACX plus to ICE with IP IPsec native tunnels. And that's going to be on Thursday, February 22nd. If your time permits, we do invite you to join us for this upcoming session. Feel free to register at your earliest convenience if you haven't done so already. The link on how to register for this session has also been posted into the chat window, but just in case you missed it, I'm gonna go ahead and repost it again in just a moment for your uh, reference. So we look forward to seeing you all there next month. Thanks again to our presenter, to our panelists, and to all of our attendees for joining us here live today. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much.